This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. For many years now, I've driven around American neighborhoods and always wondered, where have the children gone? I've also thought for many years that I was neglected as a child. But now, after talking to this week's guest, I'm beginning to wonder whether I was actually a liberated child. This is my interview with Lenore Skenazy. I'm here with someone I've wanted to talk to for years, Lenore Skenazy. Thanks for coming on this show. Oh, Thad. I didn't even know how to call you Thad or Thaddeus, so I, I'm looking at your name here on the screen. Of course, Thad? You, get to, of course you get to call me Thad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Instant um, intimacy. Okay. Yes, that's right. Uh, we strive for that here. So, um, yeah, I, I just need to talk to you. So, All right. <laughs> Look, you got me. <laughs> so let's, good. All right. Thank God. Here we go. Okay. So I have, you know, I have this thing called a son. Mm. I think you have a scene. I think you have one of those things. I, I got two. Two of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Knocking wood. So yes. my, my, my thing's 18 years old. Okay. Uh, raised in the best neighborhoods in the United States of America. Okay. Which are? Let's see. Uh, he was raised in Park Slope in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Then he was raised in Santa Monica in California. Wow. Mm hmm uh, and now he's in, and then also Eagle Rock, which is very nice where Occidental College is near LA. Oh, okay. And it's next, next to Pasadena. And now he lives in Westlake Village in Southern California, which is a very well-to-do suburb. So wow. he, he's, um, you know, his parents are highly, highly educated. His grandparents are highly educated. Uh, right and now, his great grandparents came from a shtetl in Poland. <laughs> Is uh, that the way many, it goes? <laughs> many of them came from shtetls. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and um, there, I'd say for right. Well, right now, I'm almost positive he's sitting in his bedroom looking at a screen. Mm -hmm. So are um, we. <laughs> even though, for the first time, I mean, for me, the quarant one of the nice things about the quarantine, I'm sure you've noticed this, is that kids are on the streets. Like this is the first yeah. time I've seen it in years and years and years. Right? I know. It's weird. It's like dialing back the clock. Yep. Yeah. But, um, so there have been magical moments when we happen to live on a street with other kids, his age. And those were just the golden days of his childhood. I think mm -hmm. they were the best days for me too. I mean, that's exactly mm -hmm. what I wanted. You know, I wanted to sort of be with him, but have him doing his own thing at the same time. Right. Right, it fit the perfect picture. Yeah, this interesting, you know, play between independent his pleasure and in independence, and my being a being a part of it and being, you know, the protector. Right, your pleasure also in his independence. Absolutely, you know, and you're there if he needs you. But it's great to see them spread their wings. Yeah, yeah. So, so several times I've lived in a place like that where there were a bunch of kids on the block, and it was just great. So I'd say mm, about half his mm, about half his childhood. Mm -hmm. The other half of his childhood, he's lived in neighborhoods where there were no kids. There was no one on the streets and he was all alone. And that it's increasingly painful. became clear to me was the norm just from driving around and talking to other people and being sort of, of the parenting culture. You know, I'm the famous infamous Gen X helicopter parenting culture here um, in Park Slope, you know. You oh my know, God. <laughs> ground, ground zero, say no more. Right, right. I mean, boy's hat found, says who? Who said that's a boy's hat? Remember that? <laughs> yeah. 
I remember. Why after, have we gendered the hat? I remember about a year after moving there, and all of our friends were were young parents as well, and everybody had small children. I remember after a year that um, I had a conversation about diapers every single day, and I had not had <laughs> I had not had a single conversation over a year about sex. Oh gosh, yeah. And, a lot and of I, fun, Park Slope. <laughs> and I noticed, yeah, I noticed that. So yeah, it was a totally like puritanical parenting right. business, basically. Right, we will do it right. Yeah. But you know, I'm getting at sort of the core theme here in your work, which is the the kids don't seem to be outside. <laughs> kids don't yeah. seem to be doing things on their own. And gosh darn it, I know you've said this a thousand times, and you've interviewed been interviewed by people like me, my age, and I was like, gosh darn it. It's not like what happened (laughs) because I'm, I'm going to tell you the exact same story, you know, as a 54 year old guy, 54 year old guy, I was Uh on the streets in Oakland and Berkeley all by myself from the ages of, I want to say six, four, five. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. For me it was five. Yeah. I mean, it was right around there. Um, Mm -hmm. and then all the way through never was there a time when I wasn't now we can talk about the difference between independence and loneliness and neglect, right? Which we'll get into, but I'm just sort of setting the stage here for you. So okay. l- letting you know who you're dealing with. I know. I'm seeing you. You're on a banana bike, right? <laughs> you're, you're heading towards us. I'm seeing a slur- slurpee. Is that uh-huh. what I'm seeing? Well, right, right, you're, right. you're right. good. I mean, right. I, I still respect you, but it was a big wheel. <laughs> All right. Started out as a big wheel. Okay. I think okay. we'll, oh, because you were so little. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, it was a big wheel. Right. Earl, and then it became a bike. I don't think right. I had, did I have a banana bike? No, I don't know. But yeah, you missed it. Um, so my parents were checked out. They were checked out. Were they? they? Not, uh, were they yeah. checked out or were they okay? Because a lot of times, like, I feel like my parents gave me absolutely that independence. And um, hmm. was it checked out if they weren't worried every single second I was out? I would say, um, Hmm. less worried than today's parents have been taught to be. I would, and I would also really emphasize the word taught to be or yeah. the, the, you know what? I, I just have such a hard time explaining to parents, including myself sometimes, why are we so nervous? And I feel like it feels instinctual, but it's not. <laughs> and it feels like, of course, you know, it's not that I'm so worried. I'm worried about the people out there that he's going to encounter. He's going to cross the street. There's going to be a van. There's going to be something terrible that will happen to him. And aren't parents hardwired to worry? And I, I totally think we are. And I would never say that I'm not a worry. I'm, I'm very worried. <laughs> like I'm part helicopter on my mom's side. But, mm-hmm. um, but the fear that everything will lead to doom if we're not with them, that either they'll be, you know, kidnapped, raped, or eaten, or not get into, you know, uh, Harvard. I mean, these things are superimposed by a culture. And it feels natural, because just like when you breathe in pollution, it doesn't like like right now, it doesn't feel like I'm breathing in pollution, but it's there. And that's we breathed in this fear culture for the last couple of generations that have made us think that our kids are in constant danger. And so when you really believe that because you've breathed it into your lungs and your heart it's really hard to let go and it's really hard to imagine anybody who did let go not being neglectful when actually it just wasn't part of the scene yet well god damn it lenore i need forty two thousand dollars from you right now because that's what i spent on psychotherapy over 10 years when i was in new york city (laughs) believe me i spent more than that uh so i can talk a good game doesn't mean i'm not scared that's the thing i mean i I wish that you could be a parent without being scared here's the thing here's the thing over those 10 years i learned deep in my heart that i was deep in my heart yes that i was neglected that my parents were checked out and uninterested in me and then you come along and your very first (laughs) reaction is are you sure and you just, it was an existential, you didn't see it, but it was, there was an existential just revolution in my head at that moment <laughs> because I thought, oh my God, wait a minute. What if I can reframe who my parents were? What if I can think of them now, not as like neglectful losers who just left me to roam the streets by myself all day long, but I can think of them the way that you were describing kind of yourself, just less worried, less anxious, less fearful, and therefore more trusting of me. You know, God, I should call I, my I mom right now. Right, right, right. Sorry, mom. Look at tomorrow's Father's Day. I don't know if he's still around, but if he is, no. you know, or I guess no. no. But cheers, All dad. Right, then, right then, then the the flowers in the card aren't going to do any good. Um, but 
I also don't know your parents and it's quite possible they were totally <laughs> negligent and, and horrible checked out parents or I just don't know. But right. simply um, being different than this era, it, it's sort of like, you know, their music was different and their pants were different. Their pants were pretty much the same. Dresses were different. Uh, <laughs> hairstyles were different. Parenting styles were different. It was before parenting styles were a thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd say that, uh, are you sad that you had that kind of independence? Or do you wish you had, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like a double-edged sword. Do you wish you had more involved parents to the point where they didn't think that you could handle anything? I don't know. It's such, this is the question I'm, not, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding you. It's like been the central question in my life. I mean, it's the only thing I haven't written about, interestingly, which is the most important thing. And maybe that tells me what, what my next book should be, but there you go. Yeah. To so, Lenore. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Well done, by the way. Well done. Nice angling on that one. Mm -hmm, right. <laughs> um, this book would not have begun. Uh, I think there were things that could have been a lot easier for me if there had been just some more uh, involvement right? Like the most obvious thing is, you know, I have a PhD from Columbia. They had zero to do with any of that. So meaning that, Oh yeah, I read your, <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they never even, yeah. they never asked about my grades. They I threw away my report card. They never asked about it. They never went to my school. They never talked to my teachers. They had no idea at all. It was completely Wait, now I'm remembering everything that I read about you. Okay. You had, you had an unusual <laughs> upbringing. My, my parents stayed together for 50 something years. Oh. We lived in the suburbs. My dad worked, my mom quit her job to raise me and my sister. So I wouldn't say um, we had a lot of overlap in okay. how we were raised or what our parents were thinking of. And I, mm. I was never worried that my parents were checked out because they were never like joining nudist colonies or leaving me to move to Europe without me. <laughs> so that's different. I, I'll grant you that. Okay. It's all my coming back to me. My parents never moved to Europe. You're now you're exaggerating. One, one mom. Yeah, didn't your mom move uh, to, to maybe she moved to no. uh, New York? No, no, no. She stayed. They they stayed in Berkeley, but there was nudism and there was a lot of revolutionaryism and there was a yeah. lot of running around doing stuff. Yeah, that not okay. Not, we, we, not we, being, we, yes. we can edit this part out, but I thought that your mom left for a few years, and my impression was that she left. Left. Is that not true? Not true. No, she left oh. us, but she stayed yeah. in town. She moved across. Oh, okay. Town. Okay. In my mind, it was across an ocean. Okay. No, she moved, I was, well, I was feeling for you. <laughs> I mean, she, no. Oh no, it wasn't that bad. And I don't think okay. I read it, wrote it that way. I think you need to work on your reading comprehension. I do. You know, it's, everything is interpretation, right? It's, it's, it's not what happens. It's how we interpret it. You know, how, I am a po how it hits us. I, I am a postmodernist. So that's a valid point. That's um, right. Oh, so, um, no, she, but the Pomo she, versus the Popo. That's really what everything boils down to. <laughs> Anyways, got yeah, it. I wish, um, <laughs> she moved, um, didn't move out of town, but she moved down in class and across town to a very different kind of neighborhood. And um, so it was a different life, you know, and then she, and most importantly, she didn't take us with her Yeah. for four years. And then she did take her, take us in. And then my stepfather didn't want me there. And then I got kicked out back to my dad's for the last four years. But so, you know, that's, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I would say that's history, but clearly it's the, the history informs the present. Yeah. 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 Well, um, but you know, so it made me like two things, which is very interesting um, for you, I think. Uh, very independent, obviously. Yep. I look, agree what, with that. Look, what, look what I'm doing now, right? It's like academia wouldn't give me a job, so I'm building my own goddamn university. That's pretty cool. At least I'm trying. Thank you. Um, that's really cool. So that's cool. That's really good. I'm really proud of that in myself. I like that about myself. And I think mm -hmm. my childhood, my all the freedom or whatever that was given or neglect that was given to me is part of that. Right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> freedom slash neglect. You know, right? That, so that long. Be, and like, thanks for all the neglect. Yeah, like the Libertarian <laughs> Party slogan. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, no, the Libertarian Party slogan should be a question, right? Because they're all intellectuals. If they were really honest, it would be like right. the slogan like, should be freedom or neglect. Right, or freedom? Just question mark. Yeah, right. Right. LP twenty twenty. <laughs> um. So where was I? <laughs> there was another thing you got. You got to become very independent and right. we, so we missed the other very, adjective. Right. Very independent, very successful, like on my own terms, you know. Those like are good, I, two I, good I, ones. Okay. I've accomplished, I have like tangible material things that some of which you've read, you know, that I'm very proud of, you know, that's great and done. Although you seem to be in a white box at the moment, but okay. You it's have great. stuff somewhere. <laughs> it's great. It's great technically. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I'm not terribly wealthy. That's for sure. Uh, but, um, 
but the much worse than the financial insecurity is just the general anxiety. Oh, but and I, you think the anxiety is from your childhood. I, Haven't you noticed that everyone's anxious? <laughs> Well, I wonder, like, it does yeah. seem like more and more people are anxious, um, but I've had like panic disorder and anxiety mm. since I was five. So Santa Claus on um, the, my fifth Christmas was coming to punish me. <laughs> oh God. So I was, scared. I didn't, I wasn't really clear about what it was I had done that was bad, but I just knew somewhere that I'd done. He knows that you've been naughty. It right? was not, yeah, it was not going to be mm -hmm. a happy visit. So I was lying in bed wow. Christmas Eve, scared of Santa Claus. Everybody cry, but uh, uh, d did it change when there were presents, or were there no presents? I don't remember. <laughs> oh God! This was right after the divorce, so that I'm sure that had something to do with it. <laughs> An empty sock, right? It wasn't but, even a lump of coal; it was just general dis disapprobation. <laughs> That's what was delivered to you. Yeah, that was a mix, actually. But um, so, but anyway, um. I, I think that that is also what capitalism gives to us and has certainly given to me. Like for me, capitalism has allowed me to be independent in the ways that I've been independent, right? And it's, but it's also given me a just daily, nearly anxiety. Um, I find so it, you're thinking of capitalism as a neglectful parent, <laughs> like do what you want, but if you don't, you know, if you scrape your knee, don't come to me, <laughs> that well, kind I'm, of thing. I'm wondering, and this comes back to sort of what your work is all about, right? And the central question for me in uh, it, right? Okay. Between like freedom and neglect, right? Like, um, and I'm not challenging. I'm, I, I don't even know what I think yet. I'm sort of thinking out loud here. Um, but um, I do know that, well, so here, let's do this. Okay. You have four reasons for why, I guess, our generation, right, um, has been so uh, anxious about. I, I used right? to have four. Now I have like four million, but I can oh. I can go back to my original four. But then we have to like possibly tiptoe into a couple of other ideas that have been, you know, Great. percolating. Great, because I have an idea about them. Oh. But we'll see. So let's let's. I want I want you to hear. However many you have now, however many reasons it is for our generation being so anxious about our parenting. And I'll tell you what my idea was. The Paloma Verde sponsorship of the Unregistered Podcast has turned out to be one of the greatest partnerships in business history. There are so many unregistered listeners who are now Paloma Verde customers that they represent more than 25 states, I'm proud to say. Again, Carlos and Vanessa Abelar out of San Antonio, Texas have been running Paloma Verde CBD now, and they are an independent family-owned entrepreneurial business that got trouble from big institutions like banks because they were associated with marijuana, even though it's just a CBD business. Carlos and Vanessa are so grateful to unregistered listeners that they have put together a package of my three favorite products of theirs. Their tinctures, which I've been talking about a lot, which I use every day. Their soft gels, also, which I use every single day. And their gummies, which I eat on most days. And that's why this one is empty. So if you buy those three together and you use the discount code Renegade, you get a total of 33% off. The unregistered pack is what it's called. You also, by using the discount code RENEGADE, get 25% off all of their items at palomaverdestore.com. Go there and change your life. I wouldn't even say we're necessarily that anxious about our parenting. I think we're anxious about our kids. We want them to be safe. We want them to be to have a, a path forward that we think is going to keep them you know, happy and successful, however we define that. And so the four reasons that I laid out in my book, which is 10 years old at this point, maybe 11, is um, first of all, there's the media, right? The media love nothing more than um, the story of a white middle or upper middle class child kidnapped by a stranger that turns out to be gold, uh, which we discovered, which the country discovered in 1979 when Eitan Pates was uh, taken from a, a bus stop. It's a horrible story. It was in New York. And then Adam Walsh was killed. And um, what the media recognized when they started running these stories, and especially when they did a, a, a two-hour miniseries or a two-part miniseries on um, the Adam Walsh murder, which was, I think, from 1982 or three, 
uh, was that it broke all ratings records. And of course, what do you do in TV if something breaks all the records? You say, get me more of that. And since then, we've just had the, you know, the accretion of so many, sorry, like the entire Law & Order SVU um, mm. oof, if you can call it that, <laughs> uh, you know, here I am talking to an intellectual, let's say oof, but can you spell it? <laughs> Never. Um, kind of like, like eggs. Right. Yeah, there's just in, too in, many in vowels at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> In any event, uh, that became the the go to story in fact and in fiction, and we we would go anywhere to find that story. That's why we all know the Maddie McCann story because even though it's from Portugal, it it resonated so much because she was white, she was upper middle class, and she was taken by a stranger. So sometimes when I give lectures, I ask people um, if they can tell me anything else that's happened in Portugal in the last. 500 years, and they can't. <laughs> it's just that one story because <laughs> nothing matters to us about Europe except that there was an example of this very rare, yep. horrific crime. And so we were willing to go there mm -hmm. to bring it back um, because it was very precious. So um, the media is driving us crazy by finding those stories. And what I recognized actually um, in being interviewed, you know, the, the, the seminal story for me is that I like, let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone because he wanted to do that. I wrote a column about it back when there were newspapers and I had a job. And um, two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR discussing this decision. Why had I let him do something? And the, the thing that was interesting to me about all those discussions, and many of them in the, in the 10 years since, was that at some point, the interviewer would say, yeah, everything's fine. But how would you have felt if he never came home? Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to to figure out, first of all, why are they always asking? <laughs> you know, he did come home. Mm -hmm. And secondly, don't you think you have an idea of how I'd feel if he didn't come home? Take Imagine, you know, put yourself in my <laughs> shoes. So, so why were they always asking that? And I finally realized it's because, um, I, I think it's actually two things. One is that's the, that's the arc of the story. You know, if a kid is independent, if their mom takes their eyes off them, um, something bad is going to happen. And when something didn't happen, well, let's imagine if something bad had happened. That's why when there's stories at the beginning of every school year, except maybe this year to come, there will be some kid somewhere in America who's left off at the wrong bus stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he will find his way home or she will find her way home. And the local news will do a story and they will interview uh, the mother who's saying, it's just so lucky. I just can't imagine, you know, all the horrible things could have happened. And the policeman will say, you know, this was very lucky and the, 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 the bus driver will be fired. And it will all be in the service of taking a very mundane story, which is a kid gets off at the wrong bus stop and turning it into a near kidnapping murder that just was luckily didn't happen. So there's just this, this desire to shape the story to this particular narrative because that sells. Whereas a button like, you know, kid got off at the wrong bus stop. He had to walk three blocks in the wrong direction. He cried a little bit. He got home. He got a lollipop. That's nobody cares. So part of the reason that we're so crazy is that the media is always trying to find their way to that story. But the other reason that how would you feel if you never came home comes up is to teach me a lesson that I was doing wrong think, <laughs> you know, to think that your kid could be okay, which was the way that my parents were thinking and your parents were thinking if they were thinking at all, but mine were a generation ago, two generations, I guess at this point, um, was the norm then and it was condoned nobody if, if you got lost or if you got hurt people would sympathize with your mom isn't it you know she got lost at the fair you poor thing that must have driven you crazy they'd say to the mom as opposed to why weren't you watching why weren't you with her why didn't you at velcro her to your wrist and so um the the norm of sort of believing in the world and believing in your kid and believing in the odds has been replaced by what I call worst first thinking. You're always supposed to go to that worst case scenario first if you're a good person and work your way back from like, then I feel terrible and it's all because I let her go. And so if I never let her go, then I don't have to feel that way. Nobody will blame me. I won't be on, you know, Thad's show trying to describe what a horrible thing had happened and why I wasn't, you know, uh, why I am, whatever. It's not that I'd be on Thad's show. Mm -hmm. It's that I'd be on another show or um, simply accused by the culture of, having been cavalier about mm -hmm. my child's safety. And the only way you can be uncavalier is to sort of obsess. And the only way you can obsess is by proving that you're there, by being there. And so that became mm -hmm. the norm. And if you broach that norm or breach that norm, whatever it is, if you throw the norm out the window, um, you're bad because if something bad happens, it's all your fault. It's not, um, it's not fate. 
I mean, we can get to fate later as my fifth reason now that I think that we're so crazy. But, but um, the media likes to think about children in danger. They like to present children as if they're in danger. And they really love to blame parents if something bad happens because mm -hmm. then they can look like they care. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's a mess. Okay, so that's number one. Media. That's number one. Built the built-in incentives within media to portray maximum harm for children. Right, and then you get used to seeing it. And and if you say like I'm going to let my kid wait at the bus stop, it's like what what about? And then people will sometimes say to me um, at the beginning when I was letting Izzy take the subway, it's like don't you watch Law and Order or didn't you you know what about that kid in 1979? Doesn't Aton make you scared? And at one point I did the numbers. And I realized like, I think it was 180 million people had been born since that incident that mm. hadn't, you know, that hadn't been taken from their bus stop in Soho. And that doesn't matter. Obviously there's the power of the story and the media loves the story. Okay, so enough with the media. Okay. Cut some of this out, I'm babbling too much. No, um, no, 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 this is good. I think I, think I am. Um, number one. Num number two is we live in a litigious society and um, that makes us start, you know, thinking like lawyers. It's like, what could go wrong? Could I be blamed? Is this safe enough? And um, and then there actually is the actual litigation that sometimes happens. And my most recent example was last year. What, what month are we in? Maybe it was at the beginning of this year. No, I think it was last year. Um, a kid fell off a slide in New Jersey, broke her arm. The parents sued. And it, it took a while, but in the end, the parents won. <laughs> um, and they won because they said, look, this, the slide had been at a... Uh, 35 degree angle, it was supposed to only be at a 30 degree angle. And therefore, it was so obviously dangerous. And the fact that like, millions of kids had gone up and down the slide for years, and that it was in a playground, and obviously children played on it every day, and most of them didn't fall off and break their arms, held no um, importance to the jury. And I think it was actually held on appeal, um, because everything should be so safe that if anything ever goes wrong, someone is to blame. Mm -hmm. And that feeling is combined with like, what's on the line for me? A, is my kid going to get hurt? And B, uh, you know, if you're thinking like, how would this play out in court? And you start seeing everything in terms of like, well, honestly, judge, I thought she was going to be okay. Or, you know, mostly kids can cross the street. And there's just this, this extra layer of seeing the world through the lens of risk because that's how lawyers think that's how lawyers argue in court and once again it's one of these things that's sort of seeped into our worldview that i don't think my parents were thinking about mm -hmm. when they were raising me so mm -hmm. the litigiousness is just sort of um seeing the world through the lens of risk third is wait, um wait before you go okay. there so okay i don't i don't um I don't mean to be difficult, but um, but you're about to be difficult. Okay, look, you're a professor. Okay, or pedantic. I, if this is pedantic, mm -hmm. aren't they tell, together? Right. Then tell, then tell me to shut up because that's not good. But um, okay, um, I don't think you offered a cause for the litig for the litigiousness. What, oh, what's causing it? Um, well, we are in a litigious culture. I mean, you can sue. If you ask why can you sue for anything, mm -hmm. um. I don't know if it's just that there's more lawyers or if, you know, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, is the words, whatever the word is for like, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. But by the time you can sue because, you know, your, your pants came back from the dry cleaner and they had a, you know, a spot on them that you hadn't sent them there with, you just stop thinking about what, what makes sense in terms of the world and everything becomes a bone of, um, not contention, but I'm trying to think, why do I, why are we in a litigious moment? Why is America litigious? Which it is. It's famously litigious. It is famously litigious. Well, I think first of all, because there really is no um, limit on what you can sue for and how much you can get. And I think in terms of just the way the system is set up, I think in other countries, if you sue and you lose, I think you end up having to pay um, the, the court costs to whoever wins. And so there's less incentive to think of it as like, well, I might as well go to the casino. The, the money is free. You know, I get free chips. Yeah. So if there's no downside to suing the school for the broken arm 
let's try it and maybe we'll get as they did like $150,000 or something like that. And also there might be, I mean, uh-huh. one reason for litigiousness can also be that like, if your kid breaks her arm and you don't have good insurance, it's going to cost you a lot to get the arm fixed. And so maybe there's more of an incentive. Like if, if anything goes wrong physically, you might have to sue just so that you can pay your um, bills. But I think it's more of a mindset of, um, thinking ahead to what could go wrong. And in my book, I'll just tell you. I was just going to say, so, I mean, this, that means the state has allowed this market to flourish, right? It's the it's market, market of frivolous lawsuits. And, yeah. and I don't even think yeah. it's just, so, so A, I believe there are frivolous lawsuits. I think that New Jersey one was yeah. frivolous, yeah. but I also have a hard time um, teasing out is the frivolous lawsuit itself a worst first thinking like, oh my God, if I, you know, if the kids are playing on the trampoline and the neighbor kid, you know, uh, breaks her finger, am I going to be, you know, out $2 million because they're going to sue me? So no more. I mean, like it could be that the fear of the lawsuits is also exaggerated, you Mm -hmm. know, not just that these crazy lawsuits happen, but that I'm worrying about the crazy lawsuit happening. So I'm not going to get the trampoline and I'm not going to, you know, and I'm going to have to sign this giant waiver. I mean, if you're, you're, 18 year old, I'm sure at some point he went on a a field trip across the street to like a stream or a park or down the block, or maybe took a public bus to go to the zoo. And you probably had to sign this giant waiver that was making um, a a, a legal case out of something that should have been normal. And I, I don't know how we got to this point, but God, it's, there was a there was a um, a form that this teacher showed me when I was in England once that was the waiver um, for going on a field trip there and it was there was a waiver but there was also all the rules that she had to follow and she had to fill in the things what if you're on the bus and one of the children stands up what will you do and she had to fill it in what if you're on the bus and the child is talking children are talking loudly and the bus driver asks them to be quiet what will you do and a page after page and it was turning a very normal, very safe activity into one that required the advanced planning of Normandy mm-hmm. and, um, and as if it held as much danger. And I feel like when you start thinking, breaking everything down into what could go wrong and how are you preparing for that, uh, any kind of sort of normal, easy going, like go to the park, huh, look both ways before you cross the street becomes um, crazily optimistic that kids can handle this when you haven't, you know, even, even nowadays when I try to explain things, I feel like I have to make them into a, sometimes a several step process, just so it doesn't sound like I'm saying it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. You know, it's like, well, of course you'll go to the street and you'll look left and you'll rock wife and you'll, you'll walk across the street with them a couple times. And then you'll watch them cross the street a couple times. Then you'll stand half a block back and you'll watch them. And I really, I really don't remember that happening when I was a kid. And I really think that kids are more capable. And I think that the world is pretty safe. And, um, and yet we are forced into this um, sort of like, like, like operating instructions for almost every little bit of childhood. And part of it, I think goes back to this litigious thing. Like you didn't do enough preparation. You weren't thinking hard enough. You weren't planning for all the contingencies. And then part of it is just getting so used to being told every little step to do every little thing as if you couldn't possibly figure it out that we almost have given up on believing that things are not that hard, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, that you don't need an instruction book for everything. And um, I'm not positive the litigiousness and the 17 steps to getting your kid into, you know, to brush his teeth are the exact same issue. But I feel like there's something with the, the 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 breaking down of everything into the tiny things that could happen and the tiny things you should be thinking about. There's something unnatural about that way of approaching life, whether you're thinking of it as a potential lawsuit or as something so difficult, you better go study and, and get all the steps right. I agree with all of that. I am I'm setting a trap for you. 
Uh, you are because I already feel like I fell in it. I feel like I'm like the lion waiting for like, you yeah, know, you have two, you already have two the feet mouse in. to you come have, and yeah, help you are, Yes. You already have two feet in it, but we need, we need to get the rest of your body in it. So um, two feet is all I have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what you think. <laughs> so you'll, you'll, I think you'll figure out where I'm going with this. Uh, I probably I, won't. I'm really dense. When I say this, no, hold on. Um, so it sounds to me like the state has allowed or all, all state. the states in this case, literally the states have allowed people to and offered and facilitated and offered services for people to sue for things like you know a nail in a playground for um you know your webbing on your trampoline not being exactly top notch all these things all these things that you consider to be frivolous crazy and damaging I don't, I don't think of it really as the state um well wait they're allowing it and they're and then they, they're and wait and they hire judges and they have court buildings in which you can sue your neighbor right so they didn't they don't have to allow these and they do and they facilitate well, I, I think it's i actually think it isn't it up to individual judges whether they decide this is a stupid lawsuit i'm throwing it out and, and um that's not the entire state that's an individual judge i mean oh. you're, you're talking to someone who knows nothing about the legal system but i thought that's how it worked oh of course i mean this is sort of it's basically you know based on case precedent. So, you know, it's, it's about all the series of judges making the, making various decisions over time. But so far the judges in this country have overwhelmingly said, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're up to like adjudicating in cases like this cl clearly, right. This is happening here in our courts. It, it doesn't happen with the, with the New Jersey slide. Yeah, exactly. And it's not, yeah. it doesn't happen in other countries, right? This is an American thing. We think this is the thing you do when you have some slight injury, you sue. Um, or we think that people will sue, and so we're scared or, of the slight injury. Yeah, right? but I think but the state facilitated that. So the state has also, by doing that, facilitated a huge market, right, for these lawyers, right? Because there's so <laughs> much, there's now so much money to be gained if you can sue for, you know, water falling on you. Um, you can, there's just, you know, an ocean of gold now you can get. So there's all these lawyers now competing with each other. So it's, it's this is a market mm -hmm. mechanism, I think, that's in the, that's in the works here. That's a problem. Um, I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly heard of ambulance chasers. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure there's a giant market for people suing slide manufacturers. I really don't know. Really? I mean, these get stories, okay. you know, we read them. Uh, you know, there's there's one weird thing about our country, and maybe it's any country with media, is that the weirdest, worst stories are the ones we remember because they're weird and, and, and horrible or fascinating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I worry about this myself. I, I, um, I bring to public attention cases where um, moms or, or dads, but usually moms, are uh, investigated for neglect because they let their kid walk home from the park or play at the park or play on the front lawn. And I, I bring them to public attention attention because I'm outraged. You know, this is so clearly unfair. The parent trusts their kid. They trust their neighborhood. They trust their parenting. They trust their lawn. You know, who is the government or, or, or whoever's calling 911 to, uh, to think that they have a right to decide how this parent is, is treated or is what independence this parent is giving the kid so long as it's not egregious, right? So long as it's not a, a two-year-old that they're saying go cross the, the highway. Um, and, and I publicize them because I want to make sure that this never happens to any mom or dad again. However, in the process of publicizing them, it starts feeling to some people like I can't let my kid play on the lawn. I'm going to be arrested and they're going to take my kids away. And that's generally not true. I'd say overwhelmingly it's not true. So the problem of talking about these, um, you know, the state's so crazy and they let so many nutty lawsuits get through. First of all, I'm not sure it's the state. I'm not sure, you know, who decides what is a, a legitimate lawsuit or not. Um, but I'm not sure that there are so many of these, that there, that there is a river of gold, that a lawyer will take any case where a kid trips over um, a toy at a daycare center, and now they're going to sue that daycare center out of business. I don't think it is necessarily okay. that easy to make gold out of a dumb lawsuit. I'm not so sure. So you're saying it's it's more the fear of litigation. Well, the fear of litigation. And once again, it's like the, the, the bad thing about the anomalous example 
I mean, you see it sometimes in laws that are named after a kid dies in some tragic way and we want to make sure it's never going to happen again. So, mm. you know, if Jimmy died on a Tuesday, we say, well, that's why there should be no driving on Tuesdays, because if there was no driving on Tuesdays, Jimmy would be with us today. And it's like, you know, most kids walk to school on Tuesday and didn't get run over by a steamroller. And now you're saying there can be no cars or bikes on Tuesdays. It's just we. Um, a bad, weird example will always get a lot of attention. And I am guilty of that too, um, because it serves to call attention to something that I want people to pay attention to, but it doesn't mean that it's happening every single second of every single day. And when we react to it as if it is, we cause our own, you know, a secondary problem, which is I can't let my kid walk to school. What if, what if they're, you know, somebody calls 911 on me. Right. So I wasn't really setting a trap. It was actually good because I was trying to go all the way around it. And I was, <laughs> you know, smoke signals on the side and texting while you couldn't see. Get me out of this. I'm not that kind of guy. Um, uh. I was, it was more a trap for myself, like intellectually. Here's what happened. So I, I followed your work over years and then started prepping for this. And I heard you list the four reasons. Yeah. For, for our generation's anxiety. So first of all, you and I, I believe, are positing up front that our generation is more anxious about kids than previous generations. I mean, I, I think that's true. I think you think that's I do true. think that's true. That's kind of the problem you're addressing, right? Okay, so we agree there. That's like the problem. That's the fact on the ground that to be dealt with. Um, so then it's like, then it's for me, it's like, and then it, then there's, so then you have the reasons for why this is, okay? So causal. And we've only gotten to two. Oh, we've only gotten two so far, right? <laughs> right. So I'll just say that. When, Time's when, a wasting. Yes. Sorry. When I, well, now you know, like, <laughs> what to think about as you're answering. But um, no, I was just, as I heard you talk about them before, you've done a lot of stuff on libertarian podcasts and shows and libertarians love you. I don't know if you actually are libertarian or identify as one. I don't know if I'm libertarian. Okay. Maybe you'll, maybe you can analyze me. <laughs> well, so like, and I, having kind of like a half knowledge of your work for these, all these years and knowing and seeing you on these libertarian spots, it wasn't so much about you, but I used to Wait, I've been on every spot, by the way, I've been on, you know, True. right wing, left wing one week, actually very recently, I was on the, uh, Family Online Safety Institute podcast, which is like screens aren't bad. And I was on the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood anti-screen <laughs> podcast. And I really, it's like, it's, <laughs> maybe I have like absolutely no spine at all. Really, I'm pretty moderate. I think like, you know, things aren't that bad. We can trust each other. Most people are good. Let's give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume that some screens are okay. You don't want to be on screens 24 hours a day, right. but a lot of kids are on screens because that's how they talk to each other and that's how they have fun. And it's not, are we anti-fun or are we, you know, really trying to save kids? So anyway. So I was just going to say. Total that, wimp. <laughs> that, no. So I have a lot of libertarian friends and I argue with them about a lot of things and they like you and I think they see oh. your your yeah, work that's nice they like you and they, because i think they see your work as supporting their argument and i'm not sure it does that's kind of what i'm getting at here. okay so this is well, maybe this may be a uh -huh. secondary concern to you but like i'm i'm into root causes you know and like i have mm -hmm. one theory about our generation which is more cultural and psychological and one theory which is more economic um i think well, i think all why of, don't, you know i should have done more studying of you so tell me the, your two root causes i think you should do, i mean i'm sure you've no. spent your entire life studying these and i'm asking you to describe no, them in a I, sentence or two but that would help me oh well okay sure so one is i think mm -hmm. as i was saying capitalism i think the anxiety of capitalism has become kicked into hyperdrive capitalism has always run on anxiety you know capitalism is only like 150 years old i mean basically and mass capitalism is only like a century old and then when you add technology that we have now i mean it 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 adds more wonders to capitalism's production but it also adds more anxiety you know because we're surrounded by the information that's about work and production all the time i think we so this interesting. is this is sort of speculative but i think we live in an especially anxious time we also live in a time with when capitalism is producing at a much faster rate so it goes to sort of um stands to reason that the faster the capitalism is producing, that the faster that our brains are moving and, and our minds are working and anxiety and stress are oh, usually working so much faster than mine. You're, you've just given me an, ex uh, like, uh, I work with a team that is extraordinarily productive and I can't figure out, I, I mean, maybe it's that everybody's more productive now. I really think I work with like oh. the most yeah. uh, brilliant and hardworking people I've ever worked with 
in my life. And now I'm thinking, God, is everybody out there really productive <laughs> like the team is? I mean, I really feel like I'm from like the agrarian age when, you know, <laughs> I put a, a little bit of hay between my teeth and chew it for a while and then think I'm going to write a column. And they'll have written like five blogs and they'll have made, you know, a new logo and everybody's trying to get a conference together. I'm like, I'm kind of thinking that we live in a litigious age. <laughs> so maybe everybody is faster these days and oh, yeah. it's not just my team. And I haven't noticed it because the only people I work with are my team. Oh yeah. Interesting. And we, really and, interesting. And we also live in an age when a beheading halfway across the world is instantly on our computer screens and our, our mm -hmm. phones. We're on the subway and we pull our phone out and we see a beheading. <laughs> That's sure. didn't, that didn't use to I, I've never seen a beheading. Uh, I have to say, or, but I, you know, I could or pull out our phone, and I don't think this does harm. But you know, we see like anal sex, and you know, I mean, like it's you can see and and a beheading and right bad, and bad right. combo and just and then all the political stuff gets heightened. And I just I think yes, I think this is why we've been living in a series of mass hysterias over the last five or six years, one hysteria replacing another. You know. Uh, I, I, and your I your the hysteria <laughs> and your hysteria the hysteria that you're looking at is just a longer one. It's like the enduring one. It's gone longer. It's the one I I put it at sort of the base of all the other hysterias, <laughs> right? Okay. Does that make sense? Um, I was gonna say something intelligent, but it has left me. And so instead, I'll say um, certainly the thing that I'm writing about and thinking about all the time has changed as mm. technology has changed, mm. um, but it's it's gone on longer than we've had smartphones or even computers. I mean, it was really ramping up with when there were pictures on milk cartons, and that's yeah. pretty um, my generation, yeah, right. Pretty old tech. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Um, the thing that I the thing that interests me about technology and parenting is less the immediacy of all the terrible stories that get to us. And the, you know, because I feel like ever since there was television and then cable and then computers and smartphones, yes, it's been more intense and more immediate, but it's not totally different. I mean, we could, uh, once you have television showing you horrible pictures of missing children, it's not that different from reading Facebook posts about it. But so the thing that, um, the thing that I feel technology has changed, it has given parents um, the ability to be omniscient yeah. about their kids. And that's what I was going to get to as like reason number five, um, that I think we are so anxious as parents because, and this is the one that gets a little wooey, which is that, um, you read Harry Potter and there's the Marauders map. Did you read Harry Potter? Sorry. No. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. So the Marauders map was this outrageously cool thing that Harry and his friend find and you unroll it and you can actually see on a map where the different people from Hogwarts are with the school that he's going to. You can see the bad guy, you can see your professor, you can see what they're doing. And it was like, it was magical. Hmm. And now it's find my iPhone. And so, so recently we've been given this, these magical powers of oversight of our kids um, to know where they are, often what they're doing. I mean, one of the things that I hate most was there is, I don't know if it actually got funded or if it, if it exists now, but if not, there's something similar, which is that there was a, a, a wrist watch that you would give your very young kids. They couldn't take it off, just like the felons can't get off the, wow. the, the, the ankle thing. And wow. you could call them. And then if they didn't answer immediately, your, the phone would turn into a walkie-talkie, a microphone, oh. and you could hear what was going on because the assumption was, well, if my kid isn't answering immediately, it must be, <laughs> you know, and and um, oh. and I also and, and then you, you you combine that with the Liam Neeson movies, which you probably haven't watched either, where it's taken yes, and all he hears, all right, you hear all he gets is that one little snatch of dialogue. Good boy. It's like, wait a minute, <laughs> isn't that Slavic? No, I think that's Bosnian. Well, if it's Bosnian, he must be in this part of Russia, and. Um, so it just feels like, um, you're given all the tools to know what they're reading, what they're saying, what they're watching, who they're talking to, where they are, how they're doing in school, what they ate at lunch, how'd they do on that last quiz? Uh. Are they on their way home from school? Did they get on the bus? Did they get off the bus? Did they get off the right stop? Or is this going to be on the news tonight? And, um, with that is this incredible burden of, if I know everything that's going on in their lives, um, shouldn't I be able to make it all perfect? Shouldn't I be able to know anything that's going wrong? Shouldn't I be able to fix it? And 
there was a, um, mm. there was this little bit of technology that was trying to get funding on Indiegogo that was um, a, a, a widget or an app or something where you could see everything that your child ate that day and you could cross reference it with their Fitbit. So if you knew that they'd had, you know, an apple and a piece of cake and a sandwich, but they'd only walked 1300 steps and to walk off that kind of calories, you need 1500 steps or at least another two minutes of jumping jacks. You could then sort of program your kid like, hey, you have to do two minutes of jumping jacks because I saw you had that extra bite of cake. And that struck me as like, that's what parents are sort of expected to do now. They're expected to know at a very granular level, everything, especially everything bad uh, that is going on with their kids. And and then somehow to be able to step in and fix it, which is this idea that parents should always be aware and should always be intervening. And um, it, it, it puts a real burden on you because until recently, the only omniscient being was also omnipotent. And that was, you know, some higher being. And so it is, you know, if anything goes wrong with your kid, it is so your fault. And it's your fault because you weren't doing absolutely everything possible, which is, you know, being constantly aware of absolutely everything in your kid's life to make sure it didn't happen. And that's, so that's one of the reasons I think parents are hovering. It's because they can, and if they don't, they will be blamed. And that's, that's a heavy burden. Okay. So far, reasons for helicopter parenting are the built-in incentive for the media to hype uh, threat. Horrible stories. Horrible stories and maximize threat. Two, uh, we exist in a litigious society. <laughs> Hard and to say. A, and there's a market for personal injury lawyers. And right. Whether it's, it's as big as we think or not, we I know think, that it's out there. Right. Yeah. And I think you just added a third one, which is surveillance technology. Right. A and the assumption that comes with surveillance, which is that like, are you allowed not to do surveillance? I mean, my mom didn't have to think, am I going to watch her go to school or not on the phone, on the, you know, on the, mm -hmm. the uh, whatever it is, the tracking device. And, it, you know, if you decide not to, that's a conscious decision that could be second guessed. But if you decide to watch, then you are really um, not separated from your kid and your kid probably at some point knows that you are watching, which comes with a little bit of, um, I'd say, sadness that the, the kid thinks that you don't think that she's capable, you know, that you love her, but you don't think she could really handle this, or you don't totally trust her, or you say, I trust you, but what if there's a van? And so everything becomes seen through, once again, the lens of risk and trust are all sort of disintegrating if you think that you can never let your kid separate from you and do anything successfully or safely on their own. Yeah. So surveillance, um, and it's not just physical surveillance. I mean, I, I didn't sign on for all these years that the kids were, my kids were in school, um, but there was a way you could go through some portal. And frankly, one of the reasons I didn't sign on is because I couldn't figure out the portal. Um, but a lot, a lot of people do, and you can see their minute by minute grades. And actually I was in a, a wealthy neighborhood in Connecticut about a year ago. And uh, one of the moms was telling me that the kids at the high school had hacked their system for um, for telling everybody their grade on the re most recent quiz and figured out the algorithm to turn it into their class ranking. So they could see on a minute by minute basis, you know, am I number 32 in the class or am I down to 35 now? Mm. And there's something about the What's the word? It's the, the 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 life that is constantly watched. What is there's a word for um, mm. regulated by your by your devices? The whatever that word is. There's something horrible about having that much granular knowledge about yeah. um, how you're doing. But there's a whole lot of competition going on there too, right? That's what you're getting. Right, at. and and, and I yeah. yeah, I get that that's capitalism. If you think that the only people who are going to succeed are the ones who go to Princeton, then it becomes a very scary outlook. Yeah. yeah. All right. What else you got? Oh, I was going to say we live in an expert culture. And um, as you can see from this uh, interview, I'm not a total expert on anything, uh -huh. but experts are always telling you that you're doing it wrong. Um, you know, here's 17,000 tips on how to raise a, a music lover. You know, here's how to keep your kids safe from bullying. Here's how to, um, you know, 
you've done it. Look at you're living in an empty room, but here's how to baby proof up the wazoo. And, you know, here's how to make sure that your kids never see anything inappropriate. Here's how to make sure that they never say anything inappropriate. And um, you get the feeling that you're not born with any kind of instinct. And, you know, maybe instinct is sort of cultural. And if your culture is telling you that you need an expert to tell you how to get your kid to sleep, which by the way, we used, we read a book on it. We couldn't get our kid to sleep. But if it's, if there's something that an expert is always telling you that there's something more you should do, more you should learn. Did you not read the latest study? Didn't you hear that? You know, we thought it was good for kids to eat bananas. Now it's bad. It's supposed to be bad to eat honey. Now you have to eat honey. The, the peanuts, don't eat peanuts, eat peanuts, half eat half peanuts. You know, <laughs> There's just so much information coming at you that it is really hard to stabilize your own internal sense of what what makes sense, what's safe enough, um, what can you let slide. I mean, there's just a lot of exacting and a lot of um, you did it wrong and a lot of worry. My yeah. favorite um, top 10 list from Parents Magazine was the top 10, uh, I can't remember if the word was killers, uh, hiding in your house. And number one was the laundry basket, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I was, you know, taken aback <laughs> when I realized like, there's one right there now, what should I do? And it turns out that these, these sort of springy laundry baskets that have a wire that goes through them, you know what they are? Uh, Anyways, right. okay. the point is that the wire could oh, yeah. break through and scratch your child's cornea. And so watch out. And I'm thinking they, they found a kid. It's back to the bad story. They found a kid or, or an ophthalmologist who said we had a kid who came in here and wow, that was like, yeah, a gash across the cornea. And, you know, I don't know if we'll ever see again. And they, you know, just normal things look like risks. I mean, really, it's ba it's sort of, uh, you know, mingling with the litigiousness. It's like every right. there's a risk in everything. You know, well, why do you why do you think we rely on experts so much? Well, I think part of the reason is that they um, first of all, they're there and they sell. And the reason they sell is because they're always offering you a way to protect your child from something dangerous mm -hmm. or get them ahead, which protects them from in capitalism, you know, falling into the gutter. So everybody wants their kid to be safe, me too. And everyone wants their kid to be um, successful emotionally and, um, and in real life, you know, able to earn a living. And so who could resist? This is how to raise a, a happy kid. This is how to raise a successful kid. This is how to get your kid, you know, to eat his vegetables, okay? You know, mm -hmm. hide them in the meatloaf and then hide the meatloaf in a cupcake and hide the cupcake and a peanut. Um, so there's just a lot of advice out there. And part of the reason might also be that we don't live in multi-generational families. And so grandma's not yeah. there to say, I remember my mother-in-law yes. telling me, I, you know, I was, we were in a car, my son was in a car seat and we had a bottle. Yes, we had a bottle. All right, you can throw me off the, <laughs> throw me off now. We used a bottle. And um, so uh, I fed him, you know, we're at the, the, the stoplight and I'm putting the bottle in his mouth and then the car keeps going and I take him out and my, my mother-in-law said, you know, are you hungry? Why are you taking it away? And I'm like, well, what if we stop suddenly? I don't want this to be, you know, shoved down his throat and then he'll choke. And she's like, that won't happen. It's like, well, I was reading. And so why was I thinking I was reading, you know, some expert who'd come up with a problem as opposed to my mother-in-law who had raised a baby herself that I had married, <laughs> you know, <laughs> somehow he got, you know, fully formed. So there's just a, a lot of information coming at us. I was trying to get we had nanny. Um, I was trying to get her another job at some point, and I was talking to um, the the grandma of the baby that was maybe going to hire our ex nanny. And um, the grandma said, "Well, you know, how long ago did she work for you?" And I said, "Well, you know, she worked until our kid was five or six. And she said, "So it's been a while since she was with a baby." I'm like. Yeah, <laughs> I guess, you know, I guess he wasn't a baby. So maybe it's been four years, I guess, since she's baby. So um, she said, my daughter-in-law won't hire her. And I'm like, why not? She said, well, she wants somebody who's up on the latest information. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whoa. So there is the tyranny of the latest study and wow. that you're a bad parent if you're not up on the blogs mm -hmm. and reading what's new. So you know, part of the reason there is so much information is because it will get consumed and it gets consumed if the, if people 
feel like there's information that they don't know that if only they did know their child would be safe or successful. There's a big market for it. There is a big market for I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to go talk to all my libertarian friends and tell, tell them that Lenore's book is not good for them. It's not good for their argument. It's, this is capitalism's Lenore's fault. Book. It's capitalism's fault. Well, I think so. Yeah, actually, my next part is about capitalism. My next reason, so. um, but I don't think that non-capitalism is the answer. I mean, oh, I, I, I don't either. Yeah. 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 No, I I I agree with them on most things. So I'm. Mm-hmm. This is a challenge to me too. Mm-hmm. So I'm. I'm. So this is this is making me think. This is why it's great for me. I'm not like. I'm not just okay. like smashing down your thesis at all. It's like a really interesting puzzle. Wait, am I, wait, do I still have two legs in a trap or is no, the trap, the trap, uh, no, did, the it, trap. did I, did I climb out or okay. is it, is here's, there another one ahead? I, you know, here's what happened. So I was holding the bear trap, but I was holding it open. Like, so it couldn't actually close on you. And you put your two feet in it. And I said, see, Lenore, if you go in there, I will let it go, but I'm a nice guy. So I let it, I didn't let you do it. So we're now- You the, saved me. Oh, I, okay. I saved you. Another white savior. Yeah, Great. I'm here to save- <laughs> Thanks, I'm hydra- male. I'm here, I'm here to save women, yeah. So um, <laughs> so then we just- And children. To, and <laughs> most importantly. So I'm, no, uh, the trap is no longer in place. I, I, I revealed the trap and therefore it no longer is a trap. Okay. It's, it's a line of argument now, or it's really a question. Like I'm really thinking through this. Like is how much is it, is it the state we should blame for this? How much is it- capitalism or markets that we should blame for it or how much of it is culture and psychology of society yeah. how much is it um ideas you know bad ideas floating around bad ideas lots of advice um stakes being written as really large all the time yeah. i mean once you get back to like if the kid gets off at the wrong bus stop you know all bets are off well then that makes a simple walk home into you know nam and if you say that, you know, your kid gets into Princeton or dies in the gutter, you know, you've, you've created this, this dystopian view of the world where it's like mm. either you are the king of the hill or um, you're the ant at the bottom being squished. And it's not like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but if all these stories are writ large, you're, it's very nerve wracking. It's sort of like. I, I've been watching like very, I watch no TV, but I've been barely turning on the radio now and, and looking cautiously at my online news feeds, mm-hmm. um, almost because it feels like so many things are out there to drive you crazy that to stay sane, you have to be a little removed from um, the, the story of the day, which is always going to be, you know, 17 alarms. So that's it. If you're if you're part of the world, <laughs> you're going to be scared because the world is shrieking at the moment, and it's usually shrieking something terrible is about to happen, especially to your kid. It's yeah. all your fault. If only you were paying a little more attention, your kid would be fine. But no. So. CNN, CNN, personal injury lawyers, and experts are conspiring to drive this culture forward. How's that? Um. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's just CNN, but yeah. And I mean, a sense of I mean, media. doom, media, yeah. So, and then the other thing is, um, I, I believe in capitalism, but mm-hmm. there is a marketplace out there and a really good way to sell things is through fear. So if yeah. you can convince your parents that, um, yeah. you know, your kid is going to have their head split open um, when they're toddling, you can sell them the thud guard, which is literally a, like a helmet that kids should wear or can wear. Yeah. Um, when they're toddling, there's, you know, I didn't bring, I'm, I don't have it with me, but um, normally at my lectures, I show these little cute wiggly things and people go, what are they? And I make them try to guess and they're baby knee pads, baby knee pads. Um, So that's taking something which is crawling, which is human, which everybody is doing without knee pads and rewriting it as something so dangerous or traumatic or chafing or bad that why wouldn't you as a loving parent not make them suffer the pain and the potential agony of crawling. And I think even a better example than that, but I lost it, was I used to have this thing called walking wings, which I bought just because they were a prop. And um, walking wings is really this um, vest that you put around your kid. And it has these strings attached to it, like, like marionette strings. And then you walk your child 
um, so that they learn how to walk with it. And the box says, it, this helps your child learn to walk in a more natural way. <laughs> That's not subtle at all. It's not subtle at all, but I mean, you do have to sort of like take us, you have to sort of look at your culture like an anthropologist sometimes and go, wait a minute, how could that be more natural? And then the way they justified it, and I can't remember if it was that brand or another brand said, you're, the average child will will fall <sighs> when they're learning how to walk blank times a day. And I can't remember if it was 10, 20, 30, or 40. Mm. You know, how would you feel? if you fell 30 times a day and I'd be dead if I felt 30 times a day, I'm a scrawny person with skinny little bones and I'd be dead, <laughs> but I'm not a two year old. <laughs> I'm not an 18 month old. And, uh, to rewrite a normal phase of life as something fraught with danger that is so either painful or frustrating that they can't handle it. That's sort of the big picture I'm trying to paint, which is that all of normal childhood has been rewritten as a danger that you should be very aware of. You should be actively intervening. And if you're not, something terrible will happen. And, and here I must pause to give my favorite example from Parents Magazine be, besides the, the laundry basket. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm always ready. Okay. I, I, I didn't bring it with me, but I practically have it memorized. <laughs> so, and you might've read this because um, I use this example a lot, but Parents Magazine had something called the Playdate Playbook because play dates are so incredibly complex, you need an expert to tell you how to have one. And uh, wow. there were so many interesting questions and we could talk about them offline later because there were like 10 different questions. But the one I talk about because I can't stand it is uh, the question is, your child is old enough to stay home by herself for short periods of time and often does, but now she has a play date over. Can you still run to the dry cleaner? And what does Parents Magazine say? No. Of course, of course. God no. They say God no. Right. God no, right, right, right. <laughs> exclamation point. I didn't know they had that many exclamation points. Um, yeah, absolutely not. Uh, you want to be there uh, if there's a squabble. You want to make sure that no one's feelings get too oh, hurt. Oh, gosh. They're even guarding against squabbles now. No, they're guarding against hurt. Hurt, hurt feelings, right. Hurt feelings. Hurt. So the interesting thing... Right that I've been getting towards more in the years since I wrote my book mm -hmm. is how did we start thinking of our children as so um, vulnerable and uh, that anything that hurts them, even psychologically, um, certainly physically, but also psychologically, emotionally, academically is something that is so terrible and traumatic. Um, first of all, it's awful that they're going through it. And secondly, it's doubtful that they'll ever get over it. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, like you want an err moment. It's sort of the fact that all of this is considered so dire, you know, the squabble with the friend and then they'll never be friends again and her self-esteem and then the bullying and then the bad grades and the drugs and the, you know, it's, uh, we've been encouraged to think mm -hmm. of our children as always on the brink of some disaster, either they're going to be kidnapped or they're going to feel bad, <laughs> or they're going to do badly in school. And that's driving parents crazy. It's just, you've been told that kids can't handle anything. And what's interesting is I feel like it was sold to us. So this is when I don't know if it's nefarious. I don't know if it's CNN trying to make money or the lawyers chasing that river of gold that you were talking about, mm -hmm. or if it's people who have studied children and recognize that they are, you know, they have a soul Things, you know, things might hurt them deeply and we don't even know. We're not always aware of what's going on inside them. And so you think, well, we should know and we should care and we should be conscientious and loving. And then that just gets the, the, the tide keeps going higher to like, well, they probably are feeling bad. And if they're feeling bad, they'll feel terrible forever. And there goes their sense of self-worth. And why are you letting them stay home while you're at the dry cleaner? Because this is this is the moment of truth and you've blown it. So our feeling of our desire to understand and help kids and give them a good life has been sort of, um, what's the word? Uh, has been elevated with each, with each element of their life to be like, well, this is a really big deal. And this is a really big deal. And this is a really big deal. And pretty soon 
Um, you're worried about, you know, they didn't get a Valentine, they weren't invited to that party, are all bets off for my kids joy for the future. And you're sort of told to think that way. Parents Magazine said, if there's a squabble, you should be there because they'll never figure it out on their own. So so we take we, we insert ourselves in their lives. And then the, the bad thing for the kids is that since we're always there, it's like, well, somebody else should be, you know, mom, she stole my Barbie. And instead of them working it out, because you're the dry cleaner, you're saying, okay, well, you can have the Barbie for three minutes, and then she'll have the Barbie. But she already had it for five minutes. I mean, you can't win. But we're told that we should be there and we should be intervening. And that's bad for us. And it's bad for the kids who should be learning how to deal with life without us always intervening. You know, not in terrible situations, but in a minor situation like that, for sure. Um, here's, um, you continue to like pick at my inner socialist. So my, my inner socialist right now is saying, this is a bunch of rich people's bullshit. Right? I mean, and I'm part of it. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I mean, I can give you studies that show it's not just the rich people's bullshit. Oh, good. Okay. I mean, there, there's helicopter, yeah. there's helicopter parents in the working class. <laughs> there are. I really? mean, it's, okay. it's not by choice. I mean, it's not by choice. It's back to that air that you breathe, right? So if you are, uh, the, the New York Times had an article uh, two years ago, front page. They love articles about helicopter parenting. I'm sure it makes their sales go up. Mm. Uh, and it was about uh, the pressures of intensive parenting. And what was interesting to me is that they, you know, is this just the upper middle class? Mm -hmm. And they, they, they referenced a study where people across the economic spectrum were asked, um, if you're it was something like this, if you're making dinner, if you're busy doing something and your child says, mommy, stop, come draw with me, what should you do? And across the economic spectrum, everyone said, drop what you're doing. You want to encourage your child. You want to show them that you care. And I thought it's good for the kid to see that, like, you know, you draw. That's great, honey. You're drawing. Mommy's making dinner. And I don't think that says I don't care. And, who, you know, art is for idiots. And so are you. I mean, I think it just shows that you have something to get done. And you trust them to, if they like drawing, they'll keep drawing on their own. If they want to do something else, that's fine. You'll look at the drawing later. You're not saying, I don't care ever. You're just saying that you have another priority. And what had sunk in to everybody was the idea that you must make your child's needs and wants and desires your priority at all times. And that does seem to have sunk in. Across class. Across the classes. Really? And then, and then we can talk about how terrible it is when it becomes, you know, almost the, the the social norm and that if you're not doing that and if your kid is coming home with a latch key or walking home from the park and somebody sees them, you know, they can call cops or child protective services. And of course, if you don't have a lot of means, your child might be coming home at eight and uh, with a latch key. And is that poverty or is that neglect? And, and there's a lot of mistaking poverty for neglect, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to get into socialism, it's really not fair when helicopter parenting becomes the only acceptable norm because it's expensive. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's another reason it's considered to be an upper middle class phenomenon is that, you know, surveillance technology is expensive. <laughs> um, but almost, you know, maybe I'm crazy, but I think that people, a, a lot of people have phones. Oh yeah. But I mean, rich and poor that's surveillance. That's sure. surveillance. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, all the yeah. other accoutrements that people in park slope would have, you know, um, yeah, I'll tell you. So here's another story. You tell me how this fits into your okay. worldview. Uh, I was speaking at a conference in, in California uh, to after school care providers and um, some percentage, and I think it's 50%, but I could be wrong, of the after school care is provided by the state. And when it is provided by the state, there are all sorts of um, regulations for the after school care. And one of them is that the first 90 minutes has to be spent at a desk so that your child is getting their homework done. And you could see that's great, you know, it's wonderful. You know, maybe they don't have time or place to do their homework at home or somebody who speaks English who could help them. So now everybody's getting homework help, except that if you did your homework in 10 minutes, you're stuck at that table, which just seems horrible. After you've had a whole day of school, you can't just be playing. You right. know, there's something about this academic pressure, you know, no child's gonna be left behind, but now your kid mm. is stuck at a table for 90 minutes, bored out of their mind, not moving their bodies, not making friends, not doing anything creative. And then um, there were these two women who worked at one of the after school programs and they talked about how scared they were whenever somebody came dragging their, their file cabinet with them to come and inspect them. And 
because you never knew them that was going to be, they felt like they had to um, abide by all the rules, one of which was that the regulations said that you had to have one adult for every 14 kids. Well, these were two ladies for 20 kids. But when one kid had to go to the bathroom, she would take six kids with her. Yeah. So if yeah. the inspector came and that kind of, uh, you know, so that's, is that the state providing and being uh, <laughs> generous and kind? and Or is that litigiousness? Nobody can sue because we did have one for 14 kids at all times. Or is it just crazy regulations made from afar that have nothing to do with reality and nobody ever thought, wait a minute, if a kid has to go to the bathroom, do six kids have to go with them? So um, in yeah. terms of who's living under these helicoptering rules, you know, some of it can be in your own family and some of it seems seems to be uh, superimposed, even if you're getting something um, from the state. 100% agree with all of that. Yes. Um, do we have other reasons for why our generation is so anxious about our children? This I, have, is, I have one, but go ahead. Uh, you tell me yours and then I'll see. Maybe it is mine. It's kind, of, a, it's kind of the cliched one. I think it's... Standard. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I got two that are cliched. We have so few kids. We used to not mind if we had 10 and one died. It's oh, not that, is oh, it? I haven't heard that one. No, no. Yeah, no, that's no. a bad one, <laughs> right? No. And the other is that um, that we, wait, so that we have fewer kids. I can't remember. Tell me yours. Uh, is that we are the first generation of children of divorce in large numbers in this country. Oh. So the, the divorce rate starts spiking in 1970, which is exactly the year that my parents got divorced. Um, <laughs> not to take it too personally, right? no, not that this no. whole conversation is really about how your parents were lousy parents and my mom left me for two years and she went to the other side and then she ended up very, very capitalist from what I remember. <laughs> uh, in the end, she decided she wanted nice things and nice clothes and, and completely turned her back on her entire uh, communist upbringing that you first gotten. But anyways. I, I feel like I owe you some money for the, for the shrinking here. This is, that was yeah. good. That was very yeah. good for the therapy. Um, um, where was I? Uh, <laughs> you were raging at your inner child. No. Um, raging at your Oh, child. oh, that, that, that it's a big um, overcompensation reaction by our generation. That we're, we're the first generation, and statistically it's true, um, to have about a, roughly half of us, I guess, um, are from divorces and mm -hmm. broken families. And, you know, the, the ideal family in our heads that we all have, including me, you know, gets shattered at some point and we spend the rest of our lives trying to piece it together in this way that's always imaginary because we have this ideal family everyone has their ideal family that they're trying that's to true. find the yeah. idea, even have the usually the house picked out they have the, the number, waltons the right number, the number of kids what the spouse is going to look like what job you have what street it look what the street what looks pipe like. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> right yeah. what color are going to the patches on the elbows going to be uh -huh. yeah really I, I have, is the dog scotty or you know spike right yeah so um because I had, because my parents were, as I've said, you know, neglectful, they split up. Oh, did you time. mention that? Oh yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking more about myself, Lenore. Um, I spent, nice. like my whole childhood, like fantasizing about having a family again, you know? And so like started planning, you know, planning. I started, I was a helicopter parent when I was like 14 before I had, had children. <laughs> like, you were ahead of the curve. In advance. Right? Yeah. I was like ready for it in advance. So yeah, no, I was, I, I wanted to have three kids and I wanted to, you know, live in this kind of a house and da, da, da. I had to have kids. I mean, I had to, had to have kids and, um, I had one and then I was like, good, I'm fine because <laughs> <laughs> I realized how hard it was, but I do think, and everyone around me sort of assumed that it was me correcting for what happened in my childhood. Right. Uh, who am I to say nay? It certainly could be. I don't know. I mean, and I really hadn't thought of that as a, a big, okay. um, cultural factor, but it, it could be. Okay. Oh, the, the other reason I was going to give you that is often more trite than that is that we're having our kids older. Oh. And when you have them, when you're very young, you still want to have fun. But by the time we're having them, we're practically grandparent age <laughs> and we're very, very nervous. You know, we've seen more of life and we're, I think we, we feel our fragility. And I think, I think the reason, one of, one of the reasons, maybe the reason we're having children older is that we want to do it when it's perfect. <laughs> well that's yeah so that's already stepping into it yeah the perfectionism right when, right. when everything you know because you're, you're well both. yeah you've gotten so much else right you know you got in your job or whatever yeah yeah, exactly. yeah except that it seems to be across the board um you know so where does your fury come 
you had a seem seems like a good childhood. You had your parents. My fury. Oh gosh. Um, let me get to reason six. Oh, we and have then we yet? can talk about fury. And it's and um, yeah. you said you have an editor, so we might edit this part out because it is it is a an amorphous idea. Okay. At best. Okay. Um, which is that I was talking to the professor Alan Levinovitz. He studies religion okay. at uh, James Madison University, and he explained that um, we, you know, religion is part of many people's lives, um, but the 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 swath of life that, that it covers has contracted. It used to tell us, you know, what to eat, what to wear, who to marry, facial hair, <laughs> almost everything, and now it covers, you know. Uh, whether we go to services, it covers, you know, the evil Santa, whatever it is, it covers, um, it doesn't tell us a whole lot about our everyday decisions. And that means that we are making up a lot of this as we go along. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we don't have a feeling that if we, you know, if you're following the rules, or at least if you feel that there is a bigger plan out there, that there's somebody watching besides you on your phone, that there's somebody either making the decisions or giving grace or not, um, then if something terrible happens, there can be sympathy because um, it wasn't you. It was fate. It was God's will. Who are we to question the ways of the universe as opposed to why wasn't she watching him carefully? Why did that child fall in the gorilla pit? She should have, you know, chained him to her. Yep. So um, when there isn't when there isn't a, a, a bigger picture, then it's all on us. And that sort of technology has made that even more so. And hmm. it, it feels like blame. Is hmm. there what there was, oh, God, I like my poor old brain. Emphasis on old. Is you want to have, uh, you know, if you have a, if you are in this together, as opposed to individuals making all the individual decisions, then there's a little bit of group cohesion, whereas mm -hmm. it seems like it's everyone for themselves. And if anything goes wrong, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. And rather than sympathy, your picture will be behind the anchor man. Um, you know, it's like, this is what she did. She let her kid walk to school. Yep. She let her kid wait at the bus stop. She let her, she took her kid to the, to the zoo and didn't watch him closely enough. And what a bitch. Mm -hmm. And um, there was this cool study done. I'm just writing. I'm actually, I should like write down notes all the time because I have half thoughts. So this is sort of about blame. There was a study done at the University of California, Irvine, uh, by a woman named, a professor named Barbara Sarneka and her team. And what they did is they gave um, five different groups of people the same scenario, a child waiting for half an hour in the car while mom isn't there. And they told group A that the mom wasn't there because she was you know, putting a letter in the mailbox, you know, open the door to put the letter in the mailbox, got hit by a car mm -hmm. and was out cold for half an hour. Yeah. And they told group B, mom had to do something for work for half an hour, but then she was back. They called group C that she was exercising, D that she was volunteering or the other way around. And group E that she'd gone to meet her lover for a <laughs> half hour of illicit fun. And then these groups don't know about each other, but they're asked separately, um, what level of danger was the child in? And it wasn't as exact as I'm going to make it sound, but the group that thought that the mom meant to be with the kid, but was hit by the car, thought that the kid was in five level of danger. And the group that knew that the mom was going to work was in the six level, thought the kid was at a level six, and then seven, eight, and then 10, when she was going to meet the lover. Oh my God, that kid is in horrible danger. How dare you leave her? Didn't you know? She was like almost dead. And what this study proved is that when we are, um, when we are trying to measure or gauge a child's safety or, or their endangerment, we think we're making a rational um, assessment, but really we're making a moral judgment. Yes. And we judge moms very, very harshly. Yes. And if they are doing anything that they thought like, well, I don't have to be with my kids every single second, they are already so immoral that we hate them. And of course, if they're going to have just plain old pleasure and leave the kid, they are, they are satanic. And then they did the study and they asked the same thing about men. The dad is going to mail the letter, gets hit by the truck. The dad is going to work. He's gone for half an hour, blah, 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 off to meet his lover. And for guys, uh, whether the, when the kid was, you know, they were, they were knocked out cold and couldn't get the kid, that was a five. And when they went to work, that was a five. And so 
for men, going to work was seen as inevitable. You're not docked moral points for doing it because it's not like you're choosing to do it. You have to do it. But the second a mom in our culture has anything else to do, mommy, come draw with me. (laughs) They are considered immoral because we've decided that only total surveillance and totally being worried to the point where you would feel you have to be with the kid every second is considered good enough parents parenting. And then when you have parents magazine saying, why would you go and run an errand when you could be there curating the experience and making sure that your child is fine, even emotionally every second of every play date, that's, these are enormous demands on parents. So was it that their parents divorced or that they had their kids later or that we are living in a more dangerous world? Actually, the crime rate is lower than when you or I were growing up. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter because we've rewritten the job of parent and especially the job of mother as being absolutely constant help, intervention, assistance, love, love proven, decency proven, by always being there and not letting your kid have the emotional equivalent of a paper cut. Because if they get the paper cut, that damn mom. And feminism has also told them to simultaneously (laughs) hold a fulfilling career. So here's what I think happened. Um, (laughs) Thank you for that segue. That's Um, impossible. Here's here's my segue to that. So Rebecca Traster wrote that book a couple of years ago called All the Single Ladies. And it was talking about how Um, single women were responsible for a lot of the social changes in America because they weren't tied down Mm -hmm. with family and house. And she said that the the instant we got like a teeny bit of labor saving devices in our life, and I don't even remember whether that's 1850 or 1900, but whatever it was, Mm -hmm. um, say they invented a vacuum cleaner or the washing machine and you didn't Mm -hmm. have to do the ringer anymore. There started appearing books for uh, women on, you know, you think that, there, you know, it's not so easy to set the perfect table. Remember, you want to start folding your napkins like origami and you want to have the 17 forks and don't forget that this goes here and you want to have fresh flowers and they should be wilting at this degree. And um, what she said and what I believe is that the minute it was possible for women to have a little bit of autonomy, somehow the demands placed on them as women, as, as moms and wives became a lot bigger. Mm. And it's interesting to me that just as women were getting a foothold in the workplace and feminism, and I am woman, hear me roar. It's like, you're not leaving them a daycare, are you? Um, I hope you're saying 3 million words to them before they're two, because if they don't hear exactly, if they don't listen to this entire podcast, minus the us, you know, they'll never get that enriched vocabulary. I hope you're, you know, explaining them, honey, I'm chopping the vegetables. Chopping is begins with a C, but it's actually a blend, <laughs> C-H. And, you know, C can be C-L is like clog and clog is different from chop. And there's just all these assumptions that you should be, of what you should be doing with your time. You should be reading with them. You should go to school and be part of the school day with them. You should be filling out the reading log with them. I mean, there's mm-hmm. just, it's so you know, the, the minimum is a lot higher than the minimum was when your mom was leaving you (laughs) or when my mom who quit her job to stay home with me also allowed me to walk to school at age five. And my, my favorite story about that is that I walked to school at age five and you got to the corner and there's a crossing guard, um, who was another kid. I mean, that's just amazing, right? That it used to be that kids could stop the traffic for other kids. Kids. And the amazing, the reason I bring it up is because um, my traffic, my, my crossing guard is in the next room. I married him. Oh my. Now Weird, right? what, <laughs> we what? can talk about that for another hour. What will um, your shrink say about that? Right, right, right. I never told her. <laughs> right. <laughs> you got to keep some things from your shrink. Yeah, That's definitely. how it really works. The yeah. really, the right. really hot right. stuff you want to keep. Right. Them. Withhold. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Right. Did I mention I love squirrels? Yeah. So okay. wh- why don't you talk about your projects to get rid of the stupid culture? Yeah. Um, One is talking to people all the time about it and making them remember what they liked about having some freedom and what, you know, what gets lost when you don't have that. I I usually ask people if I'll ask you, here you are so worried about your parents um, abandoning you. When you think of your favorite thing that you did as a kid, and I'm going to talk like 12 and under, so we don't get into any of your, whatever your history is. um, What'd you like to do as like a, you know, a 10 year old or what, what? Yeah. Let's say 10. 
Um, I want to 10 fifth grade. So I want to say my favorite thing. You're going to love this. Fires. Oh, how'd you know? <laughs> what was it? I've been talking was, to you for like three days. <laughs> well, I was a, <laughs> well, I was a pyromaniac. Um, oh, there we go. I almost burnt down a whole building actually and had a police record when I was 10. But no, the, my okay. favorite thing was to explore, was to walk around and explore. So, you know, there you go. There was my, there was my free range childhood right there. Uh, I was just a little chicken walking around. Mm -hmm. and um the pastor do you wish that hadn't happened i mean like do you wish you hadn't been given this opportunity to explore that you weren't exploring i I wish i wish i had had some more structure although it did not need to involve my parents right Mm -hmm. that's actually true they always say that if you have somebody who cares (laughs) about you that's that's the that's the game changer so there were two people who lived behind us in the house behind us and they became sort of my surrogate parents kind of and then my best friend's parents became my surrogate parents for a while i had a a summer camp that i loved it was very nice i went there for nine years so i got i got that and and that's if i just had more of those things and those people in my life Mm -hmm. i wouldn't have needed my parents at all to do anything no really that is what they say if you have you know you know a mentor a teacher you know, an uncle, somebody who really cares about you and, yeah. and is aware of you and checks in and, you mm-hmm. know, you know that they care and that they believe in you. Um, yep. That's, that is fantastic. Okay. But I also, so you had some of that. Yeah. But I loved my freedom too. Cause explore, I remember just exploring around here in Berkeley and Oakland, you know, just endlessly, you know, and all, as I said, from the age of four or five, all the way through, I was just walking four. the streets. So or riding my bike, one or the other. Um, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, the freedom is actually what I miss. So that's a very strong point in your favor here. <laughs> so that's a, um, uh, okay. and then, uh, so, so I started free range kids after I let my son ride the subway and there was all the blowback and became mm-hmm. America's worst mom. Um, and I went around the country and I talked about it a lot and I made the phrase popular and that's cool. Um, but so many times when I would, you know, whether talk to an individual or give a lecture or even my book, it didn't mean that things were changing. And I, I, you know, things don't change. (laughs) Things don't change unless I was just, there was a great phrase and I will mangle it, but it's basically that um, behavior, behavior change leads to more mind changing than changing your mind leads to behavior change. Because behavior change is really hard, but once you do it, then suddenly things that you thought absolutely couldn't happen become normal. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I was approached to start a nonprofit with uh, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, Daniel Shuckman, uh, who's the former chairman of FIRE, which fights for free speech Mm -hmm. on campus, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. And then I brought in Peter Gray, uh, who wrote the book Free to Learn. He's an evolutionary psychologist. He really writes about the importance of play, particularly mixed age play. we decided when we formed Let Grow, which is the name of the nonprofit, that we would aim to, to change behavior because that's really how you're going to change the norms. People have to feel it in their bones and have to see it in real life before something becomes normalized again. And so uh, Let Grow has a couple of free programs that we recommend schools try. Uh, we call them our independence initiatives. And one of them is the Let Grow Project which I can't even take credit for. And a teacher came up with it and I thought it was great, Um, which is schools sending kids home with a homework assignment that says, mom, it says I have to do something on my own without my parents. Like what? It's like, no, the school says I have to do something on my own without my parents. Like, okay, well, like what? And well, here's a list. And we have a list there. And of course you can add anything to the list. You don't have to do everything on the list, but it's everything from, you know, stuff that you would have done when you were a kid, run an errand, explore the neighborhood, ride your bike, um, take a walk, go to the, you know, wait for the bus by yourself. And if you're in a dangerous neighborhood, uh, make dinner, babysit, visit grandma down the hall. I mean, just something that separates you from the adult who would be watching you or helping you. And the reason the separation is so key uh, is because the parent who lets the kid finally go and get their own haircut or get, you know, candy from the store, 
it's, it's, it's hard. That's why the school has to push them. That's why we push the schools to push them because they wouldn't do it otherwise. Mm -hmm. But when they do and the kid comes back and they've got the Skittles or one kid went and got a Mohawk, you know, the parents, it was, the parent was mad, but in general, the parents are so thrilled and almost ecstatic. And I used that word deliberately yeah. that it seemed bizarre to me. I mean, I, I ended up doing a television show where we did this with very overproductive parents, sent the kids outside. And when the, kid, when the kids came home, the parents would sometimes literally jump up and down. One like held me and tooled me like with my feet out like a cartoon. And I couldn't understand like, why are they so happy? Is it because they really thought that the kids were going to die between here and the 7-Eleven? And I thought that's what it was at first. And then I started thinking, well, they were so relieved that the kid didn't die, that they're just, you know, celebrating. And then a couple of years ago, it dawned on me that it was bigger than that, because why is it so transformative? Why do they never go back? Why is it, why does it like a dam breaking? And it's because you have your kids, you have your kid because you want to be a parent and being a parent means that you've brought somebody else into the world who will continue to exist when you drop off the assembly line, you know, and if you're always doing everything with them and for them, you don't have any proof that, that this grand experiment of yours, that the love of your life, that that's going to work. Right. And when you see them do something on their own for the first time, it is an existential joy because you don't have to keep existing for that kid to exist and you can breathe. And so many parents can't breathe because we've been told, no, don't go to the dry cleaner, stay home. And so you never even get the fun part of parenting, which is to see your kid blossom, to see them get on their bike. And really what's been interesting during COVID mm. is how many kids have started doing stuff on their own because yep. their parents are busy and they don't have soccer and Kumon and chess and school. And the parents are seeing these children blossom that they had no idea were there kids my mom told me her kid took a bike ride her kid who always said mom will you drive me to my friend's house mm -hmm. um took a five-hour bike ride and she wasn't even riding for five hours she took a wow. bike ride and then she met her friends i mean wow we're saying wow and this is a 13 year old kid about five hours when i can guarantee you yeah. that we all had entire saturdays when sure. we didn't see our parents for eight or ten hours and yeah. it was normal for us and normal for them. So the norms have changed so much that the parents right. don't have, you know, they lack the confidence to let their kids be okay because they're worried that their kids won't be okay. So then they're always with their kids and then they never get the feedback like, no, really I am okay. So the Let Grow Project, as simple as it is and it's free, mm. is absolutely transformational. And we've heard of towns where the people started letting their kids trick or treat and towns where the, the principal of the school started seeing kids on bikes and skateboards and roller skates, which seems like she was in back to the future or something just because everyone in the school was doing it. And then it became normal again. Wow. So nice. it's, it is, it's really nice. And I can, I can, I can keep bragging about it because like I say, it's not my idea and it doesn't cost money. So why wouldn't a school try this? The, the, the teachers are excited because the kids end up being a little more mature, a little mm -hmm. more self-actualized, you know, sometimes raising yeah. their hands more. But I, I hate to have to give it other reasons. I mean, freedom in itself is, is good enough. And knowing what you're capable of and feeling good about it and not feeling anxious, is this yeah. too much for me? Yeah, it's too much for you. I, I work with a woman named Tracy. Oh, I shouldn't say her name here. She has a, a, a friend. Let's say friend, not a relative. No, not a relative at all. Um, <laughs> whose daughter was about to cut a bagel, 14 year old daughter. And then uh, she turned to her mom and said, wait, mom, can I do this? And her mom said, I'd rather you not. Mm. And took the bagel and cut it. And, uh, you know, you want your kid to be cutting a bagel. Yes. <laughs> and you'll feel good when they do. Yeah. Yep. Right. And you'll have a little free time because you won't be spending that, all your time that's right. cutting your kids bagel. So there's the Let Grow Project and the Let Grow Play Club is for schools to stay open before or after school for um, unstructured free play. So um, there's an adult there because once again, litigious society, I don't think you could actually have kids um, legally at the school without anybody watching. Um, but what you don't have is anyone organizing the game or solving the spats, stepping in in case there's a squabble. They don't do that. They're crouching in the corner with an EpiPen and the kids are 
making their own games. They're playing jump rope. They're organizing a ball game. If it's boring, they change the teams. They play backwards. All the things that kids have to learn to get along with each other, to make things happen, to focus. You know, kids are really focused when they're playing. Um, if I'm a dog and, and you're my owner, I can't say this is boring. I have to say, woof, 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 right? And that takes a little bit of um, executive function, right? Because I'm holding myself together. Yeah. So all the social emotional skills that we keep worrying the kids are losing out on or seem to have less of today. And so they have a worksheet I can learn empathy by. It's like you learn empathy by realizing that like, wow, that five-year-old, I'm not going to throw the ball that hard at him because he's five and I'm 12. So things that happen sort of automatically to keep play going and to make games fun and take, make the time fun for kids turn out to be the things that allow kids to get the self-control, the empathy, the awareness, the focus, the communication skills um, that they get through play. So you got to have kids playing and when you're in a soccer league and you're practicing your drills, you're getting good at soccer, but you're not learning all these other things. So, and also if you're worried about kids being on devices, this is a three hour swath after school when they're just playing and there aren't any devices. So, it, and, and if you're in a, in a dangerous neighborhood, well, the kids are already at school, they just stay there and they play as opposed to 90 minutes at their table. It seems like a, a very easy way of bringing um, something very important back to childhood. So where is the most important place in our society of, for cultural transmission? It's in, oh. it's in the teaching of our children. This is what everyone has always agreed on. Um, to you know, move American culture or Senegalese culture or any culture forward, mm -hmm. you gotta teach the children the culture because they're not born with it in their heads. Right. Everybody agrees on that. You are interested in fostering which I think is a good word for you, um, <laughs> a culture of freedom in that very location where that transmission is taking place. Um, it's almost like you're a you're a bandit in the ca ca castle or something, you know, that's like trying to enslave. Freedom fighter. And, yeah, you're a freedom yeah. fighter. Um, but yeah. that's- My husband says it's a civil rights issue. I mean, we really have taken away the right of kids yeah. to have any freedom. It's like they're on curfew all the time. Yeah. Um, and we're, call we're saying it's for their safety. And if it really was- for their safety, if it really was so dangerous out there that they couldn't handle anything, that's one thing. But we're taking away their freedom and pretending it's for their safety. And it's really just because we can't handle their freedom. Yep. Well, whether it's caused by capitalism or the state, <laughs> um, I'm with you 100% on the consequences of this. I don't like it one bit. And I hope you are 110% successful. <laughs> hey, that's nice to hear. Um, oh, yeah. So let me put in a plug for um, Go and Let Grow. And, no, please. you know, you can, any school can take these materials. Uh, if, you're a, if you're an individual and you want ideas for your family, there are all sorts of, our blog is full of great ideas and wonderful essays. If you go online on Facebook, you can start meeting each other. And we're hoping to do a couple other things. One is to pass laws like the free range kids law that was passed in 2018, which says it's not neglect to give your kids some freedom, some independence um, by choice or necessity, you right. know? And um, what else are we doing? Uh, we have programs for basically K through, through high school. We're trying to teach kids to be independent in their deeds and in their thinking. We nice. have a great essay contest every year called the Think for Yourself Essay Contest, the results of which will be available soon. I have to whittle down those 5,000 essays to four winners. It's painful. Um, and we have a new uh, initiative called Moral Courage, which is trying to teach kids to listen and talk to each other and find the humanity behind the people who you might disagree with. It's a great project. So, it sounds, like such, a, it yeah. sounds like such a great project. I wish it had been around when I was a kid. <laughs> it sounds like it was <laughs> in your <laughs> house. <laughs> Maybe too much of it. Was yeah, right, right. Um, but there's some structure in it, right? That's what I was missing. So it's kind of- a There nice is idea. structure in it. And I yeah. can't tell you how, how much happier kids are and parents are, because we're not saying neglect. We're saying trust. And really, a long time ago, I realized that if I could give this movement another name, I would call it the give everyone the benefit of the doubt mm. name. Um, I give parents the benefit of the doubt. I think that they, they don't mean to be 
helicoptering. So I try not to blame parents because as we've just discussed, there are so many pressures on them to be constantly um, intervening or hovering. And I trust other adults around kids. I think most people are good. I trust kids out there. I trust kids when they don't look like they're learning, that they're probably learning something, that kids are curious, that it gets turned on without somebody saying, you know, now we're going to learn. Just it's and it's a more fun world. I mean, I used to be a reporter and all I did was go around and interview strangers. And that's really fun. So I'd say, you know. Breathe a little easier and watch what your kids can do without you. You'll be proud. They'll feel like they have somebody who believes in them and the world is their oyster. So I love it. Follow her, bring her project <laughs> to your town or her, your school or wherever it is. Um, Lenore, thank you for your work all these years, oh. <laughs> doing good work. And thank you for coming yes. on the show. Well, Thad, thank you. But I'm, I'm hoping that I get to thank your editor at some point because I feel like I babble and I keep forgetting my points <laughs> no. and I look like I've lost my mind. Uh, so thank you, but you know, no. be kind. You won't need it. You won't need it. You were great. This is great. Thank you so much, Lenore. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye. Bye. This is the Unregistered Podcast and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To experience the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you.